Well, folks, it's been good to be here with you this morning. My name's Melissa, and I'm just going to be picking up where we've been taking, where, where we was left off last week, really, on, on the Sermon of Repentance. In this whole sermon series called Build, over this last month, we have been discovering and diving into the text of Ezra and Nehemiah, these Old Testament books in the Bible, which have been providing for us today individually and corporately, some very integral and foundational bricks for building a steadfast faith that will stand firm in the storms of life, in those questions that we may have that may arise in our faith journey. We long for our faith, and I'm going to say that. I'm going to hope that that's why we're here this morning, because we're longing for more of God in our lives. We're longing for a faith that is individual and corporate, together as the church, the, where we stand firm in the faith, obeying Jesus and his word until the very end. And there we go. <laughs> until, the, <laughs> until the very end. We long to stand firm in the faith until the very end. No matter what we face, no matter what trials may come our way, we want to be grounded in the word of God, stepping out in faith, taking risks, daring to do things that he has called us to do. Daring to do the things that he's called us to do. And today we're considering this foundational brick of obedience. And we ask God to build, this is why we use these words, to build is a prayer. Oh Lord, build obedience in us. Obedience in us as disciples to hear your voice and to do what you have asked us to do. To hear your voice when you're speaking to us through your word, by your spirit, through believers, and to do what he's asked us to do. As a result, he has promised us that we will stand firm. He will gather us together. There will be blessings, and we will be steady on in the storms of life. There is life in obeying God. There is life in loving God. There is life in believing God. We're going to turn our attention to Nehemiah 1, chapter 1. And now what was read for us was verses 5 to 9. That was read for us by, by Eden. It was wonderfully done. And I did choose to leave out the first couple of verses. Verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1 in Nehemiah, which I'm going to explain now. Chapters 1, 1 to 4 gives us this autobiographical backstory of a man named Nehemiah which we've been studying. We've been studying him for the last month. So hopefully you know a little bit more about who Nehemiah is. But he was living in Susa, if you missed this, and he's receiving news about Jerusalem. So they were exiled. The people of Israel had been exiled for about now 140 years, exiled out into the Bab into Babylonian era, area. And he's receiving news from his brother Hanani, who had gone on over to Jerusalem to inspect. And now they're bringing news, and the news is not good. The walls of Jerusalem have been burned, leaving it defenseless against their enemies. Now, Jerusalem has been destroyed now for about 140 years, before Nehemiah's time. Was this really the thing that was causing Nehemiah distress? Some commentators suggest that it's actually the fact that there have been several attempts now to go and rebuild the walls, and every time it's failed. It seems absolutely hopeless, and this is where we're meeting Nehemiah. He's in this hopeless, oh Lord, I hope you got a plan, prayer. I hope you got us in your hands, God. We're, I'm really sorry for the things we've done, God. Repentant prayer, and he's coming seeking God. And Nehemiah's turning to prayer, which we've looked at as a foundational brick to all of this. An element of our faith is prayer. And here Nehemiah is sitting, he's mourning, he's fasting, he's seeking Yahweh. And he's calling out for the comfort of Yahweh, which is what Nehemiah, his name, means. The comfort of Yahweh. He is seeking that comfort of Yahweh. And now with that backstory, we can better understand his prayer. He's beginning here in verse 5. If you've got your Bibles, or maybe... Well, that's okay. I've got the synopsis there. In verse 5, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. That's a pretty common theme throughout all of scripture. Love him and obey his commands. 
He's right here at the beginning. He's giving adoration where adoration is due. Praise to the God of heaven, the one who sees me even in my exiled state. He sees me and he loves me still. He is still the great God, the great and awesome God who's got the reign on the whole world. That's how he's beginning this prayer. He's the one who keeps his promises and he's calling out this holy character of God, this glorious character of God. Verse 6 Then he's calling out for God. Oh, God, would you give me your ear? (laughs) Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying for you day and night for your servants. Oh, Lord, this is my intercessory prayer for the people. Just as we had already this morning, too. This intercessory prayer for the people. Oh, God, would you hear my prayer? Give me your ear, oh, God. He continues, and in verse 6, He's confessing the sins of the Israel of the people of Jew, the, sorry the Jewish people. He's including himself. He's including his family. Now this is really interesting because Nehemiah is not a priest, right? Ezra is the priest. Nehemiah here is coming forward with, with intercessory prayer, repentance prayer, confessional prayer of the people to God, and he's a cupbearer, right? Who, okay, turns governor, who goes and turns and, like, you know, rebuilds the entire temple, temple wall in Jerusalem all over again. But he's a cupbearer to the king, King Cyrus, king of Persia. And yet he can, feels compelled to confess before God. And in verse 7, he admits to the disobedience of the commandments, decrees, and laws God gave Moses. Now, verse 8, <laughs> I like this one the most. It's, it's so captivating. Here we have Nehemiah is reminding God of God's words to Moses. By the way, God, do you remember what you said to Moses? Because I'm going to claim those same promises right now, right here. They are for us still. <laughs> he repeats what God said. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people are at the farthest horizon. I will gather them from here and bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. By the way, God, remember what you said to Moses? I'm saying it back to you. I'm claiming that promise yet again. That as we return to you, oh God, this is like Nehemiah's prayer, I'm I'm expounding it, but uh, as we return to you, oh God, would you gather us back to Jerusalem as your people, as we dwell in the place where your name is, the temple, the holy of holies? We see this idea time and time again throughout scripture. It's it's endless, actually, the amount of time that it's, it's mentioned. And sometimes it's with an if that precedes it. If you return to me, I will. If you obey me, I will. There's promises that are unfolding here. Sometimes it's not with an if. (laughs) That when the Israelites are unfaithful, God will scatter them. And yet God's own promise is this. I will gather. I will gather you together when you obey. He's reminding God of God's own words to Moses. And he's acting in faith that God will keep his word to them still. Just as God had kept his word to Moses. And if God keeps his word to Moses and Nehemiah, how does he keep his promise to us? It is still true. His promise never changes. His word remains true even today. Now there's plenty in this passage about the character of God, who he is, who he is, who he says he is. But this prayer is about a man who's seeking to do what is right in the eyes of God, wanting to lead his people, the Jewish people, back to the heart of God, returning to obedience out of love for God, to remind the Jews that they obey God because of God's love for them. Now, verse 10 and 11, again, that wasn't read, but it's, it's pretty key too. It reminds us that although they have sinned and failed, they were still God's people. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So he's referring to how he's going to go to the king and ask for a favor in this way. But they are a people loved by God and redeemed by God. 
God's word teaches us time and time again of God's love covenant with his people, with those who love him and keep his commands. What are the two commands that come to mind that God has given us through endless time? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If they were to be wrapped up, we know that passage in, in Mark, if they were to be wrapped up in two commands, this is what they would be. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Believing is loving. Loving is obeying, and obeying is believing. But what did this look like for Nehemiah and the Jewish people? But see here, Nehemiah is beginning first with this repentive prayer. And what follows next is clear action. He, he's praying, oh God, give me the strength to go before the king and ask for us to go back as an exiled people to be free from the exile and return back to Jerusalem and build yet again. Oh Lord, give me strength to take this next big step of faith that you're going to lead me. Obedience begins first with repentance, but then it also continues with this, with this step of faith. It grows legs. Obedience grows legs and moves into action, that which is in your heart. Obedience to God takes Nehemiah back to this destroyed, defenseless city. There are risks involved, huge risks. What if people don't really want to get together on this one? What if there's no teamwork? What if, like, we run out of materials? <laughs> What, what if the king changes his mind? Oh, wait, that does kind of happen, and it's delayed for a couple years, right? So these things do inevitably do happen, but he takes a step of faith in obedience to what God is calling him to do as a cupbearer to the king and lead and go. God's word teaches us time and time again of God's love covenant with his people, and this is where he's moving out of. Oh, God, I know you love us. And I'm going to step in faith and believing that you will always have us, no matter where you take us. In Nehemiah's time, the Jews had been completely dispersed and scattered. We're talking about a time when we had kind of a diaspora kind of happening all around. They had been exiled. They had been moved out into the Babylonian area. Some even escaped down to Egypt. Like, they were just, they were really all over the place. And by doing so, they were then now confronted with religions, other religions, other gods that were surrounding them. And it was harder to stay focused on who the true Yahweh was. So even as they were physically returning to Jerusalem, being called back to build, there was a spiritual returning back to Jerusalem and the temple as they sought Yahweh only. And God is gathering his people as they come back in obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and 30 really gives us this backstory of what the word was given back to Moses. This underlying love covenant. So if you've got your Bibles with me, turn with me to Deuteronomy. It's the Pentateuch. It's nearing the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're going to go to chapters 29. Nearing the end of Moses' life. And you know what? They've gone through 40 years in the wilderness, right? They've gone through these cycles where they choose to fall away from God, and then God calls them back through either a pro well, through, through, the Mo through Moses or through a prophet or through, anyways, there's a cycle of turning away from God and then calling, coming back to God, and God's gathering them together, and then they're choosing to follow God again, and then they turn away from God, and the cycle continues endlessly. But in this very amazing moment in Deuteronomy 29 and chapter 30, there's this clear, follow the covenant. Follow the covenant that was made out for you. Follow the commands of the Lord in obedience, and you will be um, blessed. See, I have set before you, this is, this, is the, this is the presentation to the people of Israel. See, I have set before you life and prosperity, death and destruction. Sorry, chapter 30, verses 11. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. They're right there on the cusp of the promised land. Moses isn't allowed to go in, but Joshua's going to lead them in. And they're right there. And the last word that is given to them is that. Choose today whom you will serve. Choose to love God, to trust him, to obey him, or choose not to trust him, not to love him, and not obey him. There is this relationship between trusting and 
sorry, between believing and loving and obeying God. Loving God is believing him, believing that he loves you, right? Believing him is obeying him, stepping out in faith and, and doing the things that he's asked you to do. Obeying him is loving him. There's a bit of a circle around this one, right? Three things that are really intric intricately connected. Now, there's, there's actually very few people that actually dare to write on the topic of obedience. I was having a hard time looking over my bookshelf going, who, where, what, obedience? Like, there's nothing really in the modern, in the last 20 years that's been amazing. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of those folks, a good theologian pastor that was confronted with the Nazi era. And he was in Germany. He was a pastor and a theologian at the time and really confronted with that which is not of God and that trying to pursue God in the midst of all these storms in these challenges in the political tensions in the war crimes and everything that was unfolding in front of him. And bon Bonhoeffer Takes, makes this claim, only he who believes is obedient, only he who is obedient believes. There is this intrinsic relationship between believing and obeying. And I'm going to read that quote there on the side. The truth is, so long as we hold both sides of the proposition together, they contain nothing inconsistent with right belief. But as soon as one is divorced from the other, it is bound to prove a stumbling block. Only those who believe obey is what we say to the part of the believer's soul which obeys. And only those who obey believe is what we say to the part of the soul of the obedient which believes. If the first half of the proposition stands alone, the believer is exposed to the dangers of cheap grace, which is another word for damnation. And if the second half stands alone, the believer is exposed to the danger of salvation through works, which is another way word for, damna for damnation. Bonhoeffer's view is that when you believe in Christ, you obey him. They come together simultaneously at the same time. If you're not obeying yet, that implies that you don't have faith yet. And if you don't have faith, you won't obey. That's why Bonhoeffer's view, you become a disciple, you receive salvation at the same time you are baptized. Hmm. Now, there are other theologians that propose a different way of thinking about it. Some say that we first believe and then we obey. A more progressive step by step. However, which way you want to take it, there is this intrinsic relationship between believing and obeying and loving God. I think at, at the core of what it is is that it reflects the Trinity to us in an amazing way. The Trinity, this love community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where we see obedience and love and faith take place. And what's more radical is that we see this in, and Bonhoeffer's quote here in the next slide is, what is extraordinary? It is the love of Jesus Christ himself, that love that goes to the cross in suffering obedience. I can't talk about obedience, our obedience, Nehemiah's obedience, anybody's obedience, without talking about Jesus' obedience, first and foremost. What is this extraordinary obedience? We can only look to Philippians 2 for that as we unpack what it looks like for Jesus to have taken that step of obedience to the Father. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used at his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now I'm going to take you down through a word study here on the word obedient. Yes, I'm going to throw out a Greek word for you. <laughs> I, I kind of kind of have to, it's in my nature, but hupakau, the word hupu, which means under, and the word haku, which means I hear. When these two words compounded together, they picture somebody who is under someone else's authority, listening to what that superior is saying to them. And after listening and taking these instructions to heart, this person then carries out the orders of his superiors. This word obedience, in the context of chapter 2, verse 8 in Philippians, tells us that obedient people are under authority, listening to what their superior is saying, carrying out the orders that have been given to them. Listening, hearing the voice of God, in this case is what we're talking about, and doing what he says. 
Jesus came to that place of obedience to the Father. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient in order to follow God's plan. Can you imagine it? And I love, I, I, I often read um, Rick Renner, who is this um, theologian that kind of really loves drawing out uh, Greek words. And so can he puts it this way. Can you imagine Jesus humbled himself to such a lowly position and became so obedient that he even stooped low enough to die the miserable death on the cross. So obedient. Jesus is God's own son, born of the Virgin Mary, word at the very beginning, stepped down to earth in the form of a human being with one purpose. One purpose. To be so obedient to the Father, to die a death on a cross he didn't deserve, to purchase our eternal salvation in whole but not in part. The salvation message. This is the invitation to life and love. And today is the day for anyone here who may have never have heard this message before. There is a God who loves you. There is Jesus, his one and only son, who died on the cross for you. He stepped down in obedience to what God wanted, gave up his life. God made a way for each one of us through Jesus' own obedient death on the cross. And each one of us, each one of us has this opportunity to be in a right relationship with God through Jesus' own willingness to die for us. He is the invitation to God. He is the example of obedience for us. He is the challenge for us. His example is the challenge for us in our own willingness to obey God in all areas of our lives. And you can, no matter who you are, no matter matter who you are, can begin this loving, trusting, obedient relationship with God. And God gives us this life through Jesus. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. Loving God is believing him. Believing him is obeying him. Obeying him is loving him. What does this look like in our own lives? Perhaps it looks like, and I would say this, obedience is a step of faith. Nehemiah's example of a step of faith, of going back to a place where he was going to be completely vulnerable with a people group he didn't know that we were actually going to get together to love a God that, well, we're going to hope he keeps his word to us. What is your next obedient step of faith? What is this looking like in your own life? 1 Peter 1 captured this. You are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, that salvation, and through him, You believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so that your faith and hope are in God. Your faith is in God, you love God, and you desire to obey him. What is that next risk that he's speaking to you about? That next step of faith. Obedience is also the pursuit of holiness. Holiness. Obedience is the pursuit of holiness. There's a story in a minor prophet of Zechariah where he tells a story in chapter 3 of a great high priest named Joshua. An angel tells Joshua who was fil- dressed with filthy clothes to take off his filthy clothes. And the angel says, see, I have taken away your sins and I will put fine garments on you. This is the holiness, the sanctification. The angel goes on to say, this is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience with me and keep my requirements... Then you will govern my house and have charge over my courts. And I will give you a place among those standing here. The minor prophet here is recording this holy moment of sanctification. That which was dirt is removed. The removal of the symbolic dirty, filthy clothes and a stepping forward into the holiness that God has called us to. We read this in 1 Peter. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Seeking holiness, that which is of God, the holiness of God is no simple task. But we can begin with the questions of what might be separating us from a deeper, fuller 
love relationship with God and ask God in this repentant spirit for the removal of that attitude, that behavior, that addiction in our life. Psalm 138 begins with, oh, with, ends with, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search out, ask God to examine you as you step forward in obedience and pursuing holiness. Obedience is also as participation in the kingdom work. We go back to Philippians chapter 2. At the beginning of it, it reads, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. Participating in kingdom work is obedience and loving one another, submitting to one another. Obedience and submitting are two words that we really kind of struggle with in the Christian church. If you have any background, that might, that might really hit some wrong chords on you this morning. But it really encapsulates this command of love your neighbor as yourself. The command of God. And that we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Trusting each other is loving each other. And loving each other is serving each other in obedience to the other. Trusting each other is loving each other. And loving each other is serving each other in obedience. Submitting one to another. Obedience is also as a daily discipleship. In this example of Christ, we want to hear the voice of God and do what he says. Daring to do what he says. Obedience to hearing God's voice and doing what he says isn't easy. There are often sacrifices, risks involved. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, There is no way to peace along the way of safety, for peace must be dared. It is itself great venture that can never be safe. Peace is the opposite of security. To demand guarantees is to want to protect oneself. Peace means giving oneself completely to God's commands, wanting no security, but in faith. Pardon me. Did I use a sheet? But in faith. We're going to hope there's the rest of the sermon involved. All right. But in faith. We're going to trust God that what he says and the risks that we take, that he will still hold us. He will still keep us in his care. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. There it is. Obedience is laying, I'm going to continue with that quote, obedience, because this was the main point. Obedience laying the destiny of the nations in the hands of God. And you have to remember his context where he's writing that, the nations for him for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not trying to direct it for selfish purposes. Battles are not won with weapons, but with God. They are won when the way leads to the cross. I think Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, still rings true for us today. See, I set before you life and prosperity and death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. And then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. I believe that God has us right here at the verge of something amazing and new, and it's amazing to be part of this. What is this new land ahead of us? Oh, we don't know. What is this going to look like in this next season of our church? I don't know. What does obedience look like right now in our hearts so that we are able to take that step of faith? So that we are ready to pursue holiness? What does it look like right now in our hearts to participate in kingdom work? 
with a readiness to love each other? What does it look like right now in our step of obedience, in our life of obedience before the Lord, that we are hearing what he says to us and we are doing it with an eager heart? I'm going to give you a few dares. Actually, no, maybe I'll tell the story first. Sorry. Getting kind of hot up here. I'm going to close with a personal story. Not, not out of way to, like, when you share personal stories in the pulpit, it's always this, like, I don't want to, you know, glorify what I did. No. This is complete glorification to God for what he did in my life. So here we go. I was out in BC. I was in my third year, second master's degree as I was working away on that, and deep, deep into my graduate studies. And I heard God give me a very personal challenge. It was one that I really didn't want to hear at the time. <laughs> It was, Melissa, are you willing to give up all of this and follow me wherever I take you? And at that point, I didn't know what I was doing with my life, but I was quite content in my little world of Fort Langley, British Columbia, in my cute one-bedroom apartment, a community of friends that made easy living there really easy, network of churches and seminary connections that would probably prove helpful in future ministry um, plans. Everything was going so nicely there. I was happy. God was still working in my life, I think, and, and working through me, I believe. But yet, the instructions were really clear. Melissa, are, are, you, are you willing to give all this up for maybe something in place that I want to take you? Places I want to take you? Are you ready? Are you willing to let loose and release everything? Now, this might not have come to you guys. Maybe you've never been given that challenge, that personal challenge. Maybe it's been in different ways, but this was mine. I had planned to go to Guatemala right after my uh, April, I guess, the end of that second semester. I plans to go to Guatemala for a month on a travel study program, studying Spanish and religion. But in order to go there, I kind of had to get rid of things first. So I started to disperse my life, give it all away, my coffee plant, my blanket, that's da 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 give it all away. And I packed what I had left into a backpack, and I headed down to Guatemala. For a month, and I truly felt like, can I use the word vagabond? I think I can. I truly felt like I had, all right, I don't know what I'm doing with my life, but hey, here we go. I've got my stuff in a bag. And saying goodbye to my friends and my community there was incredibly hard. I don't know if you've had that moment where you've had to say goodbye to people. And it didn't come easy. But down in Guatemala, I ended up emptying my bag even more because there were other people who needed things more than me. And I had a, a one-way ticket back to Toronto. And here I was, 25 years old, I think, um, and, and I came home to my parents' place. I was one of those millennial came, comebacks, right? And, and I was feeling like, oh, I have no job. I have, I, I'm halfway through the second degree. I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I really had no plans. I had very little clothes left, <laughs> less to my name. I had, I had nothing. I felt like I had nothing. And I came home to my parents' place. Thankfully, they had a bed for me still, right? And yet, God took care of me. And this is the miracle of miracles of how God works in taking care of his people. I know, within a week, within a one week, I got a job interview and the job to teach phonetics at Tyndale University. Then, because I got now a job as an instructor at the university, I needed professional clothes. I had no clothes. But miraculously, what shows up at my door was, my parents' door, was a box of women's professional clothes. Right this, like, within the same week, within this couple days passed. Great, I got clothes. <laughs> this is awesome. And then another phone call comes in, and it was confirming that, uh, in fact, another opportunity came up to teach teachers in Rwanda a little later in the summer how to transition from French to English in their educational system. The whole of the Rwandan educational system, by the way, teaching teachers with the Canadian Baptist Ministries. Okay, I guess I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Stepping out in faith takes risks. And I don't share that again to like, oh, look what I did. But it really was what, oh, look what he did. Oh, look what God did in one week. He took care of my needs. That ocean song really strikes a chord, doesn't it? Stepping out into the unknown. You never know what you're going to step out into. That takes a step of faith. Obedience is that step of faith. 
So I dare you, Queensway. I dare you in those big or little steps of faith that are going to come your way. Are you going to take it? I dare you to take that step of faith. I dare you to take those risks. When he says it to you, hear his voice and do what he asks you to do. I dare you to pursue God in his holiness. To pursue God in his holiness, that holiness nature of God, and have him cleanse you and sanctify you even more. I dare you. I dare you to be vulnerable with each other. Submitting to one another out of love for one another. What does that look like? I dare you to be vulnerable with one another. And I dare you to do what he says. I dare you. Let's pray. God Almighty, you have given us your word this morning as a challenge, as a deep heart challenge to each one of us. And we're hearing your voice. We want to hear your voice, and we want to hear those instructions, big or little instructions. And maybe it means to to go next door and meet your neighbor finally. Maybe that's the, the step of faith. Oh, Lord, we long to hear your voice, and we long to do what you've asked us to do. Help us. Oh, Lord, to take those steps of faith in believing and loving you and trusting that you have all things in your hands. You hold us in your hands. Oh, Lord, as we take those steps of obedience, would you continue to purify us, sanctify us in your holiness as we seek that, adoring you in all of your character of you as the God of heaven, who sees and loves us still. That no matter where we've been, oh God, we know we can turn to you and you love us. So Lord, we ask for your cleansing. May we hear your voice on those areas of our lives where that do need that cleansing. Work in us, oh God. Oh Lord, we pray that you will give us the strength and the compassion and the love for one another, that we get to be vulnerable to one another in this ministry here that you have called us to at Queensway. Here in these four walls, but also outside of these four walls, what is the ministry that you have called us to here in loving one another? Oh Lord, we pray that you would give us the strength, the faith continually to hear your voice and to do what you've asked us to do. I pray a blessing over our Queensway family here this morning and all who have heard these words. May it resound in our heart for the week ahead and teach us continually. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.